Thanks, Adam. All right, everyone hear me? Cool. Um, so my name is Corey Frang. My Twitter handle is NARF, if you want to say anything to me. Um, I have my slide deck up on the internet, so please follow along, especially those of you in the back of the room. Um, it might be kind of hard to read some of the code examples. Uh, there's a couple of things about the code examples. You can open any of them in JS bin by clicking on this button. Um, and also, uh, I'm going to be doing some debugging uh, in this. And so if you want to play along, you can, uh, I would suggest docking your debugger to the right. Um, but I'm actually going to open mine in a new window real quick. So if you double click on one of the lines, it'll open it up in the debugger. Is that at all readable? People nod or something. Just to, all right, cool. All right, so I work at Boku. Uh, we're a consulting and training company based in Boston. I also do a lot of work for the jQuery Foundation. I'm the infrastructure lead, worked on jQuery Core and jQuery Color and jQuery UI and jQuery insert name of other project here. I'm talking to you today about scope. Um, scope trying to think about how to look at your scopes and uh, analyze what's actually happening. So scope in JavaScript, there's, uh, it's also known as a lexical environment, which is a pretty complicated word. But um, a lexical environment means that it's defining the identifiers or like the names of the variables and the functions that you have available. Um, scopes are nested, which means that there is an outer scope, um, which I'll talk about. And outer is determined by where it was written in the code, which is very important. So let's just start out with something we probably all know, but we might as well cover the basics again. So how do you declare a variable? Um, in order to declare a variable, you use the var statement, so anything that starts with var. So in this case, we're going to uh, <coughs> sorry, assign John to John K. Paul. And when we log it, we see John, John K. Paul, just as we expect. Um, trying to access a variable that isn't declared will throw a reference error. So in these other examples, all of these examples, I'm trying to reference Scott, trying to reference Adam, or some function called say hi. They all say this is not defined. So global scope is the outermost scope. So um, in, in the browser, it's also an object, which is kind of strange. but. Um, talk a little more about this. So in var, uh, in this case, we're going to assign var adam equals adam ulvi. But we'll notice that it's available on the window object. So this is actually something that you're going to want to try to avoid. Um, but when you're writing your own code, um, and I'll, I'll give you some tips on how to do that later in the deck. So functions. Um, functions are identifiers just like variables. Um, Functions can return a value. If you don't return anything, it returns undefined. And functions are themselves values, which is something that is very strange if you're coming to JavaScript from another language. Um, you're not used to being able to pass functions around as first class citizens. They, you can treat them like objects. You can assign properties. Um, in, this, in this example here, we're going to um, just get the full name. We're going to get Leo Balter's name back. Um, and on line five here, we're also going to assign this other name and assign it the value of get full name. But we're not using the parentheses here. So it actually assigns the function itself as opposed to calling it. Um, and when we try to call that function, we get the same result as we would expect. So functions themselves have their own scope. Um, and this scope will contain any of the arguments to the function, any identifiers you declare inside of that function. Um, and it also can reference any variables that were declared in the outer scope. So in this case, I'm going to define first name and last name out here in this outer scope. And I'm able to access first name and last name here inside of get full name. But this full name variable is not accessible outside here. So if we just go through this real quick, um, we can see that uh, that is not the right slide. We can see that um, when we run this code here, we're going to step over these values. Uh, so we call get for full name, and we should see uh, Richard Gibson show up down there when we return. And when we try to log full name, the variable that we had defined inside of get full name will get another reference error. It's not defined. So in, inside of a function, you can only access local variables and variables that were declared outside. 
Declarations will happen first. This is something that we like to think of as hoisting, though it's not actually what is happening. Um, but what happens is whenever any chunk of JavaScript needs to be executed, the interpreter will run through it first and basically have a compile time. It'll look for all of the statements that start with var or function, and it will immediately declare those identifiers in that scope. So this is before it executes any code, including the assignment that happens in a var statement. So this, this looks a little weird. It's something that can be a little confusing at first. But in this example here, notice that uh, the Dave variable is still undefined until, though it is actually declared, it is in our scope, it just has no value until this line of code actually executes. So just remember that assignments happen during execution, but declaration happens first at compile time. So a little tip that I can give you is, because the interpreter is going to do it for you anyway, if you actually organize your code so that you put all of your function and your var declarations at the top of the code, um, it makes it much easier for you and your coworkers to read and know exactly what's going to be happening. Um, so when you come back to the code later, the, the var statements and the function, you can see all of the properties that will be available in your scope. So here I've just organized things so that all the variables are at the top. Notice that, um, I mean, a lot of people would do the var x here inside of the for loop, but JavaScript doesn't have blocked scope with vars. Vars apply to a function. So if we were to put the var in the for loop, we might trick ourselves into thinking that that x is local to that for loop, but it is not. It is available in the entire function, and therefore you should declare it at the top with the rest of your variables. Um, I know I just said that we don't have block scope. Uh, John Paul was just talking about let in his uh, keynote earlier this morning. Um, so I'll cover this very quickly, um, though it's not really applicable right now unless you're using some sort of transpiling. You can enable the harmony flag in V8 and uh, take a look at this um, if you want. But let is very similar to var, um, except for that it is scoped to a block. So um, this means like if you have an if statement or a while statement and you want some variable local to only that block, you can do that with let. Um, in this case, um, I'm gonna try to do let something equal big thing. And notice that like Chrome debugger can't even figure out what's going on with this scope right now. Like they haven't caught up to let in the debugger yet. This is how new this stuff is. So um, it's coming. We'll be able to use it in probably years down the road. but. So, and also notice that here I did actually declare the let inside of the for variable because it's actually doing what we would expect, which is inside of the for loop, I can see that it's big thing zero, but as soon as I get outside of the for loop and I try to reference y, it's a reference error because it only exists inside of that for loop. This is really cool. Um, we'll be able to use this later. So when it does come around, however, I would encourage you to not just whole style replace var with let. For the most case, it would be very similar if you had defined all your vars first. However, there's this interesting thing called a temporal dead zone, which I just wanted to be able to say, so I put it in a slide. And uh, what happens is you end up with let something on line four, but if we try to access something before it's been declared with the let, we get a reference error. Even though it is available in that block, it has not yet been defined. It's in a temporal dead zone. It's a really neat term. Uh, so there are some things about JavaScript scope that will leave a bad taste in your mouth. Um, and I'm going to try to tell you about them so that you can protect yourselves. And, and we have declarations, right? Like you can redeclare an identifier as many times as you want. And it makes it really confusing. Like why would you do this to yourself? Please don't. Um, but in this first example, like if I hadn't told you what A was, would you be able to tell me what it was? That's, that's a really good question, right? Like, in this case, because of the way it works, function A, that second one, is the one that gets defined at the top of the file. But then we assign A to equal the string A, and by the time we're underneath all the functions, it's still equal to this other value. Like, this is very confusing. Use strict will just not let you do this. As soon as you try to redeclare an identifier, it gives you a syntax error, which is like even better than a reference error. You can't even execute the code. Um, the other thing that you can use is JS hint, um, which I would suggest, like, using this, like, build it into your editor. Like, Sublime Text has a good plugin for it. Whatever editor you're using, use something that lends your code, because it will stop you from making a lot of common mistakes, including redeclaring identifiers. 
Another thing that it will also fix is undeclared identifiers. This is a, this is a problem that you just don't realize it would happen. Um, but if you don't declare an identifier, eventually it just keeps looking up the scope, up the scope, up the scope, doesn't find it, and it gets to the global scope. And the global scope says, well, I don't have a variable called what, but I'm going to make it for you on the global scope and assign that value. So right here, I thought this what was going to be local to my own OMG function, but it's not. It's, it's become available on the global namespace. And this is, this is actually something that you could you catch yourself with a lot of problems here. So please try to avoid this one. So the last one here, uh, this is called shadowing, which is actually, give you a little bit of a bad taste, but it's also kind of cool in exactly what you would expect. So we call this shadowing because when, uh, in this case, I'm going to set name outside. I'm going to set it to be Alex Sexton. And uh, I'm going to try to say that name. And I'm going to do a console log. But notice that same name. It's the same word, but inside of the function name, name is going to refer to that argument. And outside of the function name, name is going to refer to the variable that I declared in the global scope here. So it's a little awkward to see the same name everywhere. And if you keep doing this, it could get really hard for you to mentally process. But if you want to reuse the variable x and you're inside of an inner function, you can get away with it. Just don't do it too many times because it gets really hard to keep track of. And you end up with something that's more like a colliding scope. So you're unable to tell which name it is, right? You got, you got no idea, and it's just mesmerizing. You get confused and fall off. So functions can contain other functions also. So any code that you've written, you can make it into a function. And this is where things start to get really cool with JavaScript. So even code that's already been inside of a function, <laughs> Boaz just got the colliding scope pun, by the way. Um, let's give it up for Boaz. Right? Uh, so even code that's already inside of a function. Uh, so we can take this code and put it into, the, uh, uh, into its own function. And in, if we declare a function inside of another function, it's only available inside that function. So it's like local to that function, right? Just like a variable we declare. If we write a function inside of a function, only available in that function. And they will also have scope to their parent functions, just like any other function. Um, so let's try to like, look at what that would mean for us. So, uh, this first example, I'm just starting with something that looks kind of normal. I wrote a function called multiply, and it takes factor and number and returns factor times number. Very simple, returns 10. This is, is something that we've all seen probably. Um, so we can, for reasons that I'm going to show you in the next couple slides, make an inner function that does the hard work. Right here, the hardest thing about that function is multiplying two numbers. So we're going to put it in its own function, and then we're going to return calling that function. And it does exactly what we would think. We get the same result. Um, we're able to multiply 2 and 5, still the same. Um, moving into part 2, like what happens when we return the function itself instead of executing it? So we're going to call make, or in this case, the only change here is that I removed the parentheses from this line here. I'm no longer calling the function immediately. I'm returning it. So here, I'm going to get a result. I'm actually going to do this one in the debugger real quick. So I'm going to call make multiply 2, 5, and it's going to go in here, and it's going to immediately return me do multiply, which is this function. So now I have a function in result that's called do multiply. Notice here that like result is a function, like we returned a function. This makes sense. But when I call that function, what am I going to get? So I go in here, and there's this term called a closure, which I'll explain a little more. But down here in my outer scope, I still have the values 2 and 5 from when I called the function earlier. And so I still get the value 10. Um, and vac factor is still not defined like we would expect. So this is inside of this other scope. So that's kind of neat, but it's not very useful because 2 and 5 are, we, we never get a chance to change anything. That we have a function that returns 10. Congratulations. That's all it will ever do. So how can we make that more useful? And, and in, for this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove number from the, the make multiply, and I'm going to put it on the inner function. So now we have this interesting concept where we can create functions that do slightly different things, even though the code to do it is exactly the same. On line six here, I'm going to create a function called double. Um, 
which is going to make a multiply with two. And I'm going to create another one called triple. And they're both pointing to the do multiply function. So what's going to happen when we try to call double with five? We get in here and we see that our factor is two and that the number is five. We get 10 like we would expect. Um, we're going to come into triple and we're going to see that the factor is three. So there are actually two copies of the do multiply function being stored out there. One of them where in its outer scope factor was two and one of them where it was three. Um, and this allows us to create functions that do something very similar but operate on say a different element. So you have like 10 elements that all do the same thing, create 10 functions, create 10 scopes, and then bind all of your, bind all of your, uh, your events inside of there. So some other examples of how these sorts of functions can be used. Um, we, we're going to also double four just to show you that the factor is still two when we call double, even though it was three when we call triple. Um, and we're going to try this trick, which is kind of fun, right? Because we're returning a function, we can actually execute the return value from make multiply. So we're going to multiply six and seven. So right here, we're getting the factor six multiply back. And now we're going to step inside and get times seven. And we're going to get 42. Uh, just like we would expect. I know that's kind of confusing to think about, but every time you call the function, it's creating the shell, the scope for you, where all of the identifiers have been declared. But you can fill that shell with whatever you need to. Um, each time it's a different shell, but it looks exactly the same. It has the same variables, but they have different values depending on which execution you came through. Um, so, so far I've just been really showing you function definitions, but there's, there's also function expressions in JavaScript. So anything, anytime you don't start the line with the word, or the statement with the word function, you get a function expression. Um, this is a pretty common pattern, uh, to see, or a pretty common thing to see used, but it, it's a little different. Like when you do var something equals a function, you have to remember that that var, because of the way it works, the assignment expression will not happen until the var executes. So in this particular case, when we look here, get full name still has not been defined when we're here. But then as soon as we assign it to the value of this function expression, it gets defined. So uh, I'm going to call this function with Mike and Sharav. And when I step into here, I just wanted to show you that fn expression, which is the, the name that I put here. Um, is, is available inside of the function itself. This is a neat little trick for recursion. Um, you, can, you can reference the function name inside of itself too. It's a part of the scope. But just like anything else that would be in that function scope, it is not available in the outer scope, which is a little confusing because the function expression is not a declaration. So we did not declare fn expression in the outer scope. We declared it in the function scope. So a really common function expression that you see a lot is called the iffy, uh, which is a name that was come up by one of my coworkers, Ben. Um, it's an immediately invoked function expression. We've, we were doing this long before it was called an iffy, um, but this is how it works. Um, it creates a new scope um, by being a function. Um, and inside of that scope, you can have whatever variables you want and they will not leak to the global. That's like one guarantee because they're inside of a function, they're not in the global, which is really good for like protecting or making private variables that are internal. Um, another thing that you see very common, especially with jQuery code, is uh, because jQuery has the no conflict mode where it removes dollar sign um, as one of its aliases, you can add dollar sign back to your standard grammar by creating an iffy. So in this case, I'm going to uh, in order to like trick the compiler into not treating this as a declaration, I have to put something before the word function, otherwise it's going to be a declaration. So in this particular case, I'm going to put a parenthesis there. Um, and down here where the function ends, I'm going to put the closing parenthesis, and then I'm going to immediately call it, just like we saw in that uh, make multiply example where I called the function twice in a row. It was because I returned a function, I can just call it. So here we go. We're going to pass jQuery into iffy. That's the first thing that happens when we execute this code. So we're going to step over this uh, because that was just an expression, right? 
So now we're going to call this function with jQuery. And we note that when we step in here, we now have a dollar sign variable that's, a very, that's available everywhere inside of this function, and it's always going to point to jQuery. Um, even if the jQuery in the window got deleted, that dollar sign will still point to jQuery. Um, you can also have local variables. In this case, I'm going to set up Alex Schmitz as a, as a local variable. And when I console log Alex here, I get his name. And this is how you can export things back out of your, uh, your iffies. You can either return a value and assign it to something if you wanted to, or you can just assign a value directly to window that you want to be available everywhere. So this kind of lets you create like a little module of code that's available somewhere else. And it has access to Alex, but code outside of here has access to the exported value, but not access to Alex. So it's pretty much all you need to know with regards to scope to like figure out the rules and figure out what's happening. I'm going to talk to you a little more about this, but I want to cover a couple other concepts too. So this. This is available in every scope. There is a word called this, but it is not at all related to scope. Some people, when they first see this, they're thinking that it's related to the current scope. So this example does not work. Um, but what the idea here was like, I have this variable called not exported, and I want to make it available. So I'm going to return this and then try to access it. It does not work. It's not what this is. Um, in fact, this has nothing to do with scope. So what this is, is determined where you call the function. And I'm mostly putting this slide in there for reference. Um, I'm not going to go over each of these very much. But I just want you to be able to look back at this and know what would this be if I call the function this way. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time on it in this, in this slide here, which is, um, I'll let you, uh, all right. So um, we're going to take a look at what it would be in a couple different situations. So here, when we call it, with uh, in the global scope, it's going to end up being global uh, because I have the var name up here in the global. When, when I log this dot name, it's going to grab it from the global and give me global. Um, so if we're doing use strict, we would have gotten undefined and that would have been an error. Um, it's, it's useful to not accidentally get your global scope in this um, because you can accidentally pollute your global scope. You want to avoid that. So uh, user one, we're going to call show name on, on user one, like user one dot show name. Uh, I defined it right here. Um, we're going to get Ryan back from that. Um, and in this case, I'm going to do dot call with pass it user two. Um, and I'm going to get Clark back. Um, and this is another example using bind, which is a new uh, feature available in ES5. Um, we also have a, a jQuery alias uh, that, that will help you with that. If you're not sure whether or not you're going to have bind, you can use jQuery.proxy if you go look that up on the. And, and one thing that's worth noting, though, is that there's this idea of, in this case, object.showName. That worked when we called it immediately. But if we assign the function at object.showName to a new variable name, in this case, we're going to call it unbound. So we have our function. Um, oh, I renamed that. Sorry. Bad. I'll fix that before. Uh, so that should have been user one dot show name. But um, what happens here is, even though we got it off of user one, um, the the variable is not or the function is not being called in that context because we're calling it in a global context, which can be a little confusing, especially when you're working with jQuery um, and you're passing functions to like uh, events like dot click do something. Um, your this value is going to not be what you expect. Um, in fact, in jQuery, jQuery specifically has a few meanings uh, for what we put the, or set the, this value to in your functions. So anytime that you're in an event callback, like a click or double click or, I mean, hover, any event callback, this is going to be the element that the event is being ha like fired on so, uh, or, or caught at, rather. Um, so like if you're clicking on a button, this is the button, the HTML element that is the button. Um, Ajax callbacks will have a this set to the uh, options object that was passed to Ajax. Um, not very useful, uh, so just bind it to whatever you want. And uh, in an each, 
this will be every element of the array. So like if you're eaching over a collection of elements, this will be each element as you go through it. This is different in every scope. So it's really easy to lose track of this. Um, some people, this is like uh, JavaScript taking a selfie right here. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people do this. You, you set var self equals this. Um, I actually don't really like this pattern because it, it feels a little like anti-pattern to me to like, let's, let's store this variable that points to something that we should be able to just pass through our function chain. So uh, I, I usually consider using uh, bind or jQuery proxy or just trying to rewrite the code so that I don't need this in any way. Um, though if you do decide to take selfies, please don't name it self, like name it something that has meaning. Um, because self doesn't mean anything to you when you're reading the code later, you can be like, but if it was button equals this, you'd be like, oh, that's the button. Makes it a lot easier for you. So another kind of confusing thing in JavaScript, right? Like the, if we were to talk about the things that confuse you the most as a new JavaScripter, you have scopes, this, and then the last one is prototype. Um, I'm gonna try to cover all of them in one talk, crazy. So uh, all JavaScript objects have a prototype. So in the internal prototype method, um, when you read a property on an object, um, it's going to check that object first. So if we say like object.name, if name is not defined on the object, it looks at its prototype. And if it's not defined on that prototype, it looks at that pro the prototype's prototype forever, forever until you run out of prototypes and eventually you get undefined. Um, unlike scope, where if you tried to make an assignment, like it just assigns it in whichever scope that variable is declared, with, with, with an object, whenever you make an assignment to an object, it always happens on that innermost object, which the object on top of that prototype chain. So if you say object.a equals something, it will never end up being assigned to the object's prototype. It will always be assigned to the object itself. So uh, an example of how we might use a prototype. Um, in this particular case, uh, I'm gonna create a function here that's like by, by convention a constructor. So we're gonna capitalize it, um, which means that we're gonna use new to create this. Um, so uh, it takes a first and a last name and it signs these variables to itself, the this object. So this is really useful with prototypes because you can do this, which is here we're gonna have a say hi and we're gonna log my first name plus my last name, say hi. <coughs> Should be console.log. Um, so on this, uh, when, we, when we create a new person here, it's gonna set it up to be Scott Gonzalez. Um, step in here, we get, uh, this is a person. Notice that it's kinda like uh, the debugger knows that it was created from a, a, the person constructor, so it calls it a person. So we get Scott Gonzalez. Um, this is actually kind of what new does, in case you were ever curious. Um, new does an object.create, um, which is something new from ES5, so like you can't use object to create everywhere, but you can use new everywhere. So it creates a new object based on the person's prototype. So if you see it like new object, attach the person prototype. Um, and then call person, pass it that object you just created, and set it up to be, this one's gonna be Adam Sontag, who's over here. What, what? <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna tell Scott to say hi, which uh, is gonna happen, and we're gonna tell Adam to say hi, and it's gonna happen. Hi. Um, and one thing that's actually kind of interesting, I'm gonna do this down here. Uh, so I'm gonna do Scott dot say hi um, is equal to Adam dot say hi. Um, and this is just a thing. We are using the exact same function. It's assigned on our prototype. We only had to write this function once. JavaScript only has one record of this function in its memory. There are a lot of really good reasons to, to go with prototypes. So this same sort of example, but using a closure, which I kind of described to you earlier. Closure is what happens when you have a function inside of a function. So in this case, rather than using the prototype, I'm going to add a say hi method to myself that's going to log my full name. Um, and in this case, uh, I'm gonna create a closed person here. Uh, and I'm gonna assign full name to equal first plus last and the word hi, because you know, when you rename variables and forget to rename them. Uh, so you end up with this dot say hi being a function 
that is always going to have access, just like in the other examples, always going to have access to that closure where first and last exists. So we're going to call say hi, and we're going to log my full name um, saying hi. Um, the bonus here is that it doesn't actually rely on this. So it doesn't matter what this is. So if we were to take that unbound method off of Corey.sayHi and call it, we still get Corey saying hi because it comes in through the scope rather than relying on this. So there's benefits to using closures and there are benefits to using prototypes. Um, you kind of have to measure whether or not you want quick templated objects or you want to like create complex scopes that have state. Um, you can really think of it either way and uh, both work, just uh, be responsible. So why would you use prototype? Um, if you've ever written a jQuery plugin, you already have. Um, jQuery.fn is an alias to its prototype. So any function you create on jQuery.fn is available on every jQuery object. And you can do that as a user of jQuery as opposed to the implementer. You don't have to go in and add a new function creation to the constructor. You can just add a function to the prototype and suddenly you have a much more powerful jQuery that will allow you to log items. Um, in, in this case, anytime you do this, this will be set to the jQuery collection itself. So you can do like this.each do something. Um, and you can write your own little utility functions that are available on every selection you make in jQuery. Um, one thing that's really useful about prototypes is that you don't have to store that scope um, in that constructor. In this closed person example, every time I create a new person, it's going to have to retain this scope because I'm exporting this function. And it won't be able to get rid of that scope until I get rid of that function. So if you think about it like, it, it just, you're not allowed to throw away the full name here. It, it's just gonna hold on to it forever until you get rid of that person. Whereas if it had been internally in a prototype method, there's nothing, no artifact sitting around in memory. Um, so when you're looking at your code and you're thinking about it, really want to think about the uh, principle of least privilege, as it's called, um, which scope and all of this and the way that this all relates um, is basically if you keep less information available to every function, you will write less bugs. It's a pretty simple concept, but if you don't know enough to get yourself into trouble, you can't get into trouble. So keep your scopes tiny. Keep small functions that do immediate work and return values or create functions that do other things. Minimize your references, like don't just store vars around all the time. If you do some bit of work that has like three steps to do the work, if you do all of that work in a function and return the value, as soon as that function gets done executing, you can get rid of all of those in between steps in memory. You don't have to keep them around. You can benefit your garbage collector. You can trick it into knowing what it can get rid of by letting it be in scopes that are no longer in use. Um, if you modular, modularize, why can't I say that word? Um, it, it does something um, very useful too, which is now rather than having all of your code in a giant JavaScript file, you can write small little modules, each with their own iffy that talk to each other and uh, give them the chance to uh, communicate without sharing a bunch of global state. So you end up with less stuff in your memory, less references, less ways you can get yourself into trouble. Um, and all in all, the jQuery motto, uh, write less, do more, is very much about principle of the least privilege also. Like, just don't get yourself into trouble by making your functions do too much. So a couple of tips that I talked about and I want to go over them again is like always try to define your variables and your functions first. Um, it's easiest for you. Uh, use strict is very useful, though I would not suggest doing it in the global, like at the top level of your script file. If what I would actually suggest is like one tip I can give you, go home. If you have any scripts that aren't using the jQuery style iffy, like put it in there because it, it will put all your variables in a, in a private closure that only you can access um, inside of your code and like no external code could accidentally screw you up. Um, so 
put the use strict inside of that iffy rather than at the top of the, the scope because some weird things can happen if you do a use script in the global, or use strict in the global scope. Um, it can get a little awkward with stuff that isn't using use strict. So uh, also lint, use JS hint. Uh, use some linting tool to make sure that you're not making a bunch of common mistakes, not all of them related to scope. Sometimes you forget semicolons. Um, this will tell you. Name your functions. This is something that, that uh, even, even those anonymous functions you pass into a click handler, if you name it, when the function executes and you're looking, if, if there's a bug, you're looking at it in the stack trace, it has a name, which means you can find it really easily in your code. Um, if you don't give it a name, it's just like anonymous function, line 312, blah, right? Like, it, if you give it a name, you can be like, oh, it's in click button, that's where the problem is. Um, so write yourself smaller functions, and give yourself smarter scopes, and modularize. So those are the big tips, um, and that would be my talk. And If there, if there aren't any questions, I did bring myself a little bit of a code example that I can refactor, but uh, if there are questions, anyone? All right, I'm gonna jump into the refactor then. Also, please feel free to uh, find me after the talk somewhere and talk about anything in scope. So uh, this code was donated to me by uh, someone sitting in this room, and maybe they'll be embarrassed, but uh, hopefully they didn't write it. Um, <laughs> So uh, this was probably written a few years ago before somebody really understood how JavaScript can work, right? So we're just gonna take a look over this code real quick. The exact stuff that's happening here is not really important, but I just looked at this real fast, and I noticed that we have this Ajax here that sets a bunch of things. And we have this Ajax here that sets a bunch of things. We have this Ajax here that sets a bunch of things. And they all look really, really similar. And they all reference this post URL, which is just like a variable sitting up here in the global scope. So w the first thing that came to mind for me was like function do Ajax and then like the data we want to pass to that Ajax. And um, this was also probably written in old jQuery before we had promises. So we'll be able to use that a little bit here too. Uh, but let's just do this first. Like the post URL was only used for these Ajax calls. So let's get it out Let's, let's remove it from some place where code that doesn't involve Ajax could accidentally overwrite that value. Like, let's get it somewhere where we could have it protected. So let's put it inside this function. Um, so we're gonna do our dollar Ajax. We're basically just gonna move this code from here, put it up here for now, and we're gonna return that. So the data, actually, we, we decided we're gonna pass that in instead of uh, defining it in this function. And rather than use success, um, I'm gonna, actually, here, let's just do this, callback. So we're gonna pass it a callback. So down here now that I got rid of all that stuff, the, the method that we want now is do Ajax QS data and then our function that we wanted as our callback, right? And we can do that now in this one also, do Ajax. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, right, right. No, no, I mean, like, this is good, right? Like, this is what you want to, like, look at and be like, where am I repeating myself? How can I repeat myself less? That's like, don't repeat yourself. Be dry, as opposed to wet, where you write everything twice. Um, so here we have some commented out code. Don't leave this stuff around either. Like once we comment out code like, and it stays in our repo, it gets really confusing for future developers. Do Ajax, we're gonna take this data and we're going to pass it to success. Now I actually can't test any of this code, so I could have written a bug, but I don't really care, right? We're just like having an example here, so. But we already feel a little bit shorter because we got rid of a bunch of repeated code, and now the, the URL of our Ajax is protected inside of our do Ajax function, and that's kind of neat. One thing that's happening here, though, is that we're actually passing this callback in, um, and that means that this callback is in the scope of this Ajax call and, and things like that that get a little weird, but with promises, which uh, I'm sure someone else has talked about promises, you actually don't need to 
do this success callback anymore. You can use what's called then um, and pass a callback in afterwards. So Ajax is, Ajax is going to return us a promise. So rather than um, passing our callback, we're going to now do dot then do this function. Right? Little simpler, and the reason that this is actually better is because now this function is not going to be in that other scope. We didn't need it there. The, what we were doing with the data was unimportant to the job of getting the data. So get rid of it. Don't give yourself that, that foot gun. Um, another thing that's like really common here is uh, I'm seeing JQ poll wrapper has been uh, accessed a few times, and every time we're looking it up. This is a, just a pretty common jQuery tip, which is like if you're going to reuse a selection and you don't expect it to change, um, in this case, actually, we're, we're not going to be able to do much about this because it's doing replace with, I just realized, which means that every time you write it, it's like removing that original jQ poll wrapper. But you, we, we, so we'll still have to search for it every time. So we're not going to be able to do anything there. And actually, it's probably, where am I at time-wise? Like, got three minutes and 23 seconds. All right. I'll, if anyone else wants to talk about other things that might have been possible, anyone see anything here that like looks like you could probably clean it up? Callbacks. Name the callbacks. Yes, that would be a great thing. So like, uh, what's this one doing? Uh, function. Uh, I have no idea what this is doing. Give me a function name, Ryan. This is your code. <laughs> name it. Uh, that's replacing an existing poll with a new one. So it's new Replace poll. Yeah. All right. So now we know what that function is. If there was an error in it, we're going to see that. Um, anyone else have any ideas of ways that this could be better? Or Yeah, so um, right now, there's another one that's happening is we just keep building these query strings, um, which is actually um, not needed, because jQuery will automatically do that for you if you pass it an object. So uh, we're starting here with t equals poll. So let's, um, oops. So rather than doing a string t equals poll, we're going to do an object where t equals poll. String poll. Though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so 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 then we're going to set our o to be the value of this cookie. And actually, that's the string O, or not using that. Yeah, there we go. So like that, instead of using the, the method where we're like writing strings manually, like let jQuery do that. It does it better than you do. Um, it does all the replacements you need to make it safe and sanitary. So. All right, thanks, everyone.